to you. Indeed, if anything, the plagues tell us how great our God is, how mighty our God is. In his redeeming love to redeem a people, hearing us in our affliction and saving us. We have seen throughout the place the Lord has told Pharaoh through Moses the great purpose of the plagues was the redemption of Israel but also that the Egyptians might know that he is the Lord and God alone above all gods and the seventh plague and the hail brought a fuller disclosure we saw that last week that not only so that they may know that there is none God like the Lord in all the earth but the Lord had raised up Pharaoh to manifest his power in him, to show his power. And thirdly, that his name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And today we see another purpose in that the redemption, that Israel might be retelling this redemptive work of God from one son to the next grandson, from generation to generation, how they dealt with Pharaoh and Egypt and how his people were delivered. Why? For the same reason. So that they may know that I am the Lord. Why has the Lord redeemed us at all? Why? Because so that we might know that he is the Lord who loved us and redeemed us. That we might glorify him. That we might tell the next generation. Our children. Our children's children. All that the Lord has done for us in Christ. A redemption. Which is retold. What we'll see here today is this redemption retold. A redemption refused. And a redemption repackaged. Well, that's what I want us to see. Redemption retold, redemption refused, and redemption repackaged. So let's take a look. It's retold, isn't it, to Israel there in verse 2. And you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I've dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. This retelling of what the Lord has done. God's mighty acts are done so that they might be retold to one another, to galvanise God's people together, to strengthen them, that the Lord is with them, that he is mighty to save them, that he is a redeeming God who heard their affliction and their bondage and slavery and came and saved them in order that they might know the Lord their God and that they might be the vehicle and the means of declaring God's blessing to the nations. In Exodus 6-7 it says that I will take you to be my people says the Lord. I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of of the Egyptians Moses instructs this retelling as well of this redemption at the consecration of the firstborn the feast of the unleavened bread in Exodus 13 and verse 3 there's the after the redemption after they've been brought out the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread and the consecration of the firstborn there Moses verse 3 said to the people remember this day In which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord has brought you out from this place. They were to tell it in their families, in their homes. They were to teach it to their children and their children's children. And they were to remember it nationally as a people of God. And so it is with us, we remember as the church of God's redeeming work in Christ as we gathered around the Lord's table. We tell it to our children as we catechise them and we nurture them in our family worship. It's a redemption which is to be retold. 
not only retold, retained and remembered and shared so they would know the Lord. Notice after their redemption, it is then that the moral law is given. It's not that the moral law was given and they couldn't keep the moral law so they redeemed and they, rede- they were redeemed and the moral law was given to them. And the law summarised, didn't it? You know, the, the, the Shema summarised the law. That they were to love God and they were to love their neighbour as a redeemed people. As they awaited uh, to go into the promised land. They would not forget the Lord. They would not turn back to idols. Didn't last long, did it? That they would fear him. That they would not go after other gods. But they would flourish under God, in God's economy, with God, with his people. But this wasn't the case. A free week journey took 40 years. The gospel is to be retold. The greater redemption that Christ procured is to be retold. Conquering over Satan, sin and death. Fulfilling all righteousness. Actively obedient and passively obedient. Dying on a cross for our sins. To be told to one another in the church. We gather, don't we? Lord's Day. To hear God's word. To hear this redemption retold. And then to go out into the world and proclaim it. Of all God's mighty acts in Christ. Of who he is and what he has done. And what he is doing. Bringing redemption. Those mighty signs. Those mighty acts. The incarnation. God becoming flesh. Dwelling amongst us in the second person of the Godhead. His mighty signs and acts in his miracles and wonders. Before those like Pharaoh who had hardened hearts. Delighting in the law of God and fulfilling all righteousness. He becomes our righteousness. His mighty acts over the devil and sin and death. 1 John 3, 8 tells us that the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And at the cross he gave himself as a propitiation for our sins. And then he was raised from the dead, conquered death. And he's now at God's right hand forever interceding. There is one God and one mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus. And who sent his Holy Spirit. Convicts of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Who grants new birth and gives a new heart. Making us his own redeemed people. And instructs us in the knowledge of God and in the word. Think about this for a moment. If the Lord had not fulfilled the purposes in Pharaoh, in verse 1, in hardening his heart, his heart heart was already hardened, of course, in further hardening his heart, there would have been no national redemption for Israel to be retold or remembered or celebrated. Likewise, if there had been no devil, no sin, no hardened hearts, there would have been no Christ, no redemption for the church, no gospel to retell. But there was, and there is, and this redemption God decreed to be retold to the praise of his glorious grace, to declare his glory, that his name might be magnified by his people whom he saves. It must be retold to our sons and our daughters. It must be retold in the family, in the church. It must be retold in the world. Who redeems our God? What are the implications of this retelling of redemption? Well, as believers, our faith is nourished. Our faith is nourished. We grow. And retelling the gospel to others, faith is birthed. In our families, in our children, in our children's children. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. 
And what are they hearing? The word of God, of God's redemption. And then those who know the Lord go on to fear the Lord, flourish in Christ, delighting in his law, and retelling this gospel to the next generation in the world. So redemption is to be retold. God's redemption retold. And God's redemption refused, isn't it? We see next, God's redemption refused. Verses 3 to 7. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land, and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from this day they came on the earth to this day then he turned and went out from Pharaoh and then verse 7 the Pharaoh's servants said to him how long shall this man be a snare to us let the men go that they may serve the Lord, their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Darkness is descending, isn't it? The, the refusal is causing this ongoing descent of darkness. The third cycle of plagues here, the hail, the locusts and the darkness are, are, are following on from one another in intensity uh, and culminating in that death of the firstborn and the deliverance. But here we see all the livestock in all the fields and all the crops would be destroyed, those which remained after the hail, which whereby Pharaoh was comforted by the fact that still there was some bird in the crops. And he continued to harden his heart, didn't he, in uh, chapter 9. But here we see in verse 1 of chapter 10, it is the Lord who hardens his heart. He's in a state of rebellion, in a state of refusal. He refuses, verse 3, to humble himself. Rather, he is a man who exalts himself. And so judgment falls upon the land. The plague of locusts descends upon the whole land of Egypt. A devastating pest, locusts. The world's most devastating pest. They increase in number to such an extent that swarms can create thick darkness. Like clouds of blackness. It covered the land. They can multiply 20 fold and can reach densities of 80 million per square kilometre. And a single locust will consume 2 grams of vegetation and a swarm of 80 million can consume the equivalent of food for 35,000 people. Egypt, was this localised swarm of locusts? No, covered all the land of Egypt. Stretching north to south, 880 miles. East to west, 792 miles. A darkness covering whole land. A biblical proportions of a plague manifesting the power of God. Egypt, probably at this time, sustained 3 to 4 million people. And with dwindling crops, limited resources in the Nile, depleted cattle. And then comes this swarm of locusts. You can imagine the ruin the people must have feared. That's why the servants say, Egypt is ruined. And Pharaoh was forewarned. Verse 3. They will eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. Yet Pharaoh refused to let the people go. Verse 15, so these locusts came, they covered the face of the whole land. The land was darkened, they ate all the plants, all the fruit trees, nothing was left, nothing. 
Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Some implications of this refusal. This darkness that covered over the face of the earth in this swarm of locusts. There's another darkness here, isn't there? There's a darkness that is covered over the heart of Pharaoh and his servants. It is the Lord has hardened their hearts. Egypt is ruined, but they themselves are also ruined in their natural state. They are engulfed in a spiritual darkness themselves. And this is the predicament of fallen man, isn't it? In our ruined nature. Man is ruined. That is a, man, is not necess, man is not good in his natural state. Man is bad in his natural state. He is ruined. Total depravity. Yes, he can do some nice things. But in his nature, it is totally depraved. Fallen. And they can understand some of the things of God, like the magicians before them. These servants recognise that they're ruined. They recognise that this is a, a work of God. They have some measure of the knowledge of God, and yet not true knowledge. These servants are like the magicians before them are always learning and listening like Janes and Jambers but they're never coming to the knowledge of the truth because they are ruined by nature. Like Pharaoh, they are men and women full of pride. They are exalting themselves. They believe the lie in the garden that they shall be like God. I mean, Pharaoh was the divine representative of the gods, believed to be a god. And such it is with people today. People are full of pride. We, we heard about it on Thursday night, how in our fallen, ruined, natured state, we seek the defrowment of God and the enthronement of self as God, full of pride. And that ruins not only the person, the ruined nature ruins a people, it ruins a, a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, says Proverbs. But sin is a reproach to any people. Egypt is ruined. And so are a people who continually refuse the redemption that God brings to the nations, not just to Egypt. As we saw last week that God showed mercy and grace not only to the Israelites but also to the Egyptians in that they could have responded and believed and some did. And the Egyptians we saw there on the day of Pentecost were gathered and saw the mighty works of God. God has a plan for the nations. And then we see this, this ruinness in the, the, the false gods. The symbiotic relationship that the people have with the Nile, the land and the air and all the gods of Egypt. They also are ruined. These mighty acts of God show that he alone is God and the others are but idols. They are helpless against Yahweh. He alone is the God of all the earth. Before him there is no other. And this is demonstrated. Uh, showing before each and every judgment. Is a judgment upon the gods of Egypt. Upon that which they worship. Whether it's the. Here the gods of the land are being attacked as it were. Min is a patron god of crops. Nepri the god of grain. Anubis the guardian of fields. And Shenan the protector against pests. 
Where's the protection against these pests under God? There is none. They are idols. They are senseless. They are quiet. The crops are ruined. The grain is no more. The fields are barren. The pests are not held back. The locusts eat it all. And Yahweh's judgment manifests his power that he alone is God in all the earth and there is no other. And the servants see it. We are ruined. Egypt is facing a humanitarian crisis in a fertile land of abundance. It's all decimated. The Nile and the land. How are we going to ever feed ourselves? Egypt is ruined. Economically bankrupt, super prosperous economy. And yet here we are. How are we going to trade? What have we got to trade in our storehouses? It's all ruined. And spiritually, the plethora of gods we've worshipped are proven to be idols created by man's own imaginations. Egypt is ruined. Friends, what God did for Pharaoh in this judgment, he will do ultimately in the lives of all those who refuse God's redemption, who continue to bow down to the false gods in our world to this day, the false gods of the worship of self, the false gods of paganism, the false gods in the religions of the world, the false gods of the philosophies of men, the false gods of the secular age. Judgment will fall upon all those who indulge in the idolatry of the worship of the created rather than the creator who is forever praised. <clears throat> Yahweh will expose and topple every false god we worship. And when we trust in these gods... And they topple, it does hurt us, doesn't it? But fall they must. Even our own, we must put away our gods. Israel had to put away their gods. We have to put away our gods as the Lord's redeemed. For those gods cannot save us, we must trust in the Lord. These false gods can only leave us in darkness. And ultimately bring ruin. The good news of redemption that he saves us out of our ruined condition, doesn't he? Titus 3, uh, 4. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray to various passions and pleasures, passing our day in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That is not to be as the redeemed but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our saviour appeared he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness but according to his own mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit so that we receive God's redemption no longer refuse it because of the work of God who has redeemed us and saved us in Christ and applied it by his spirit to us we receive redemption and no longer refuse it it is a work of God and then we see redemption repackaged here in verses 7 to 11 redemption repackaged Pharaoh's servant said to him how long shall this man be a snare to us let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron went, brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, and we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go, the men among you. And serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. <laughs> Ruined natures will always seek to repackage the gospel of redemption. They will always seek to repackage uh, the way that we are to be saved. 
And they will always bring it on their terms. But redemption comes on God's terms, not on man's terms. These servants, like the magicians before them, and even though they had hardened hearts, they see the circumstances, they see all that's going on on the ground, and they advise Pharaoh in this matter to let the men go and serve the Lord. Note, firstly, this is for their own sake, for the sake of the Egypt, for their own relief. There's no repentance here in the servants' uh, thinking. They're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not humbled by what has happened. They're wanting relief. They are actually bitter men. They uh, resent Moses, the prophet. Verse 7, how long shall this man be a snare to us? He's a snare. This message, all that he's, he's doing, this is a problem. They want relief. Notice also they qualify who is to be redeemed to Pharaoh. They advise Pharaoh on who is to be redeemed, as it were. Let the men go, he said, they say. It's their specific that they may serve their God. They influence Pharaoh in this matter, who parrots what they say regarding who can be redeemed in verses 8 to 11. And so it's according to what they say and not the Lord. And Moses explains, doesn't he? No, no. It's not just the men who need to be redeemed, who need to, to come out. Uh, we, we see that, don't we? What does Pharaoh say? Moses said, we will go with our young, our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. With all that God has ordained to, to take it out. All God's people and all God's possessions will be redeemed. Not just men. Some implications. They're bitter. These servants are bitter. In regard to the, the redemption that Moses has brought. The mighty acts and the signs. And as Christians, when we're engaging in the world with people with ruined natures, and they see God at work, and the transformative power of the gospel, don't be surprised that others don't believe, even after they see God at work and, and are bitter, and they speak disparagingly, about you as a Christian that's what Martin was saying don't be surprised that people will speak disparagingly because you bring a gospel of redemption we need to take heart Jesus said blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account we want to be liked but if we, we're not going to be light when we bring this gospel of redemption. People are going to be bitter. People are going to be malicious. But rejoice and be glad, says Jesus. Your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rather, Jesus says, we need to be concerned when people speak well of us. <laughs> And say all kind of good things about us. That's when we need to be concerned. So they did the false prophets, said Jesus. Plus also, ruined people with ruined natures misunderstand. Moses wasn't a snare. Moses was bringing salvation to them. He was bringing the message of redemption. He was bringing a message of mercy. They, they could have responded. They could have let go. This message of redemption isn't a snare. It's salvation. It's reversed. Those in the world still under judgment are the ones who are already snared. The world is snared as slavery to sin in bondage. 
and worship of the self and all the false gods of this age which brings ruin and Jesus comes and sets the captives free he redeems people he redeems them they are already ruined and then we see look ruin that he seeks to repackage this redemption only the men are to be redeemed of course this is a a redemption of their own making. It's still embedded in, in much of what we see today in the Catholic Church, who have an elaborate system of salvation through the church and not in Christ alone. They've repackaged and rebranded God's redemption. They've dictated who is the redeemed and how to be redeemed. Or liberal Christianity, a gospel of works, of universal salvation. There are those in the church who have repackaged penal substitution. Like Steve Chalk. And then they drive out, don't they? Verse 11, they're driving out God's true servants. We're bringing the gospel of redemption. And in so doing, they're showing their ruined condition. Fourthly, we see redemption here is according to the servants and Pharaoh's terms. It's man's will. Man wills it, doesn't he? This is the will of man. Who is to be redeemed? That it's in you that you have the power and the ability to be redeemed. But it's the will of the Lord who will be redeemed. Before the foundation of the world, he has ordained a people to be saved. The Gentiles heard the gospel in the book of Acts, and when they heard it, they were glad, it says, and they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Just as Pharaoh was ordained to be an object of God's wrath, so there were those ordained to to be saved. It wasn't a, a, a question of the will or exertion of man, but it was of God. He willed it to be. We are a people saved by grace through faith. It's not of our own doing. We don't bring anything to the table. We don't dictate to God who is going to be redeemed or whether I'm going to be redeemed. God brings us to the table. God works in us repentance and believing into that ruined nature by the regenerating power of the Spirit. It's according to his will and purposes who will be saved. Not according to my will. My will is in bondage. It cannot choose God. It can only repackage this redemption through a, a gospel of works or, or, or whatever way. That it's up to me. It's not up to you. It's up to God. It's God who humbles. God who convicts. God who brings uh, conviction and, and of righteousness and of judgment. And then look finally, this redemption repackage brings this false repentance, doesn't it? At Pharaoh, verses 16 and 17, he hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now there, for forgive my sin, please, only this once, and plead with the Lord that your God only to remove this death from me. Look what happens when natural man wills repentance in his natural state. What do you get? Well, you get Pharaoh, don't you? You get the servants as an example. The natural man with a hardened heart who refuses to humble himself, who dictates the terms on how they will be redeemed, who maybe seeks something after God but doesn't come to God on his terms and only seeks relief for themselves. Can such a man truly repent? We see a false repentance here in Pharaoh. It's seen in his haste. What is he thinking about? He simply wants relief. After all that is done before him. And like previously, it's happened before in chapter 9, verses 27 to 28. 
he gets his request. But what does happen? We see that it's just for relief because everything goes back to normal. He hardens his heart, he carries on. And God hardens his heart. And that's what we see so often when so many people, time and time again, say, yes, I, I, I want to repent, I want to be forgiven of all my sins. And yet really they're, they're coming, they just want relief from the present trial or present situation. And yet, once all things sort of go back to normal, they, they sort of go back and carry on as they were. As John says, they didn't continue with us because they were never of us. There was a time alone proves whether repentance is genuine and faith is genuine. Time alone proves it. Also in Pharaoh, we see he's got all the biblical language. His repentance is orthodox it's correct sinned against the lord and his neighbor and he asked for forgiveness but it's all shallow it only springs from the desire to avert the consequences verse 17 remove this death from me many wrongly believe that coming to god is just like oh you just got to say sorry just come to a sugar daddy, sail away into the sunset, live happily ever after. But repentance and faith means a lifelong of ongoing discipline and admonishment of the Lord and of repentance ongoingly. Hebrews 12, 7, it is for the discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And false repentance also minimises one's sin. Verse 17, forgive me this one time, basically he's saying. He's failing to see the depths of his ruined nature, the offence that he is, of his ongoing sinful actions, the real gravity of God's judgment upon him. He minimises it all. Because he's dead. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seek after God. All have turned away. They have become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Their poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. This is Pharaoh. But let's not just point the finger at Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh isn't the exception. He isn't the monster. He's just like you and me. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But praise be to God. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Pharaoh serves as a warning. Is our repentance, is it genuine? Is it true? Is it a godly grief that produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret? Are we continuing? Are we persevering? Whereas worldly grief will only produce death. And that's what Pharaoh faced. Redemption repackaged. Redemption refused by Pharaoh. But redemption must be retold and applied by Christ. Oh, perfect redemption. A purchase of blood to every believer. The promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives.